Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. My name is Dr. Jonathan Spring. I'm a senior vulnerability researcher here at the Software Engineering Institute's CERT Division, CERT Coordination Center. I am joined today by my colleagues, Alan Householder and Eric Hattelbeck. Today, we're going to talk about an approach to prioritizing vulnerability response that we developed here at the SEI that we're calling stakeholder-specific vulnerability categorization. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. So let's start off by having you tell us a little bit about what you do here at the SEI day to day and that sort of a thing. Alan, I think you've been here the longest, so (laughs) we're going to give you the honor of going first. Thanks. (laughs) Um, I'll go last. Yeah, so I'm the technical lead uh, for uh, threat ecosystem analysis which is a long way of saying that I do a lot of modeling and mathematics uh, related uh, tasks associated with either uh, vulnerability categorization, sometimes it it gets into malware clustering and other things like that, Um, and also uh, looking at coordinated vulnerability disclosure and uh, some other sort of large scale, macro scale problems within uh, cybersecurity and vulnerability uh, disclosure and vulnerability analysis. Great. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, go next. Okay, uh, so my background is actually philosophy of science. I have a PhD in that, so uh, some of the technical stuff is is left to the colleagues often. But I'm on Alan's uh, same team, the threat ecosystem analysis team. Um, right now, though, what I'm spending most of my time on is vulnerability coordination, um, straight coordinating with the team, uh, taking cases, coordinating with vendors um, and researchers, and trying to get vulnerabilities patched before they get out and, yeah. and wreak havoc. So that's right. kind of what I'm what I'm up to at the moment. Yeah. Well, yeah, reducing havoc seems like great. So I also, I'm on the same team. Uh, I have been working on the vulnerability uh, categorization stuff as well as some machine learning aspects of things uh, related to incident response, incident response, automation, uh, philosophy of science. I did some network forensics and things like that in the past, but uh, not so much anymore, although I was at FlowCon talking about those sorts of things somewhat recently. So let's talk now about vulnerability management, sort of at a little bit of a higher level to introduce that. Mm -hmm. So what is uh, vulnerability management maybe first briefly, and then how or what are the current tools for it? Like namely, how does the common vulnerability scoring system, CVSS, play into vulnerability management? On the first element? Sure. So I think the... uh Vulnerability management actually kind of means a few different things to a few different people. So, uh, in our in our situation, we we really talk about it as the thing that happens uh, both at the vendor uh, who produces the software and needs to fix something, and they need to uh, analyze you know reports they receive and triage them and and do things, make decisions about how they're going to prioritize their efforts. Um, and then they release patches, and there are folks who have that software deployed in their networks, and they need to deploy that. Uh, and they also probably need to make prioritization decisions about what they're doing, uh, what they should do next, and how how quickly they should patch things, because it's not always possible to patch everything. Um, there's also some aspects of uh, scanning for vulnerabilities and doing penetration tests and whatever uh, to find uh, to find out what's wrong in your network and going and remediating those things as well. And that also involves prioritization decisions on uh, those reports. Um, so I think those are the, the three main aspects. Really. Yeah, I mean, I think there's the other side too, like the coordination side that I am kind of doing now where you, you have in the researchers as well, right? So so to get the, the vendors the information they need that there's that there is a vulnerability, often that takes somebody, a researcher, finding that in the first place. And right. so then what do they do with that? Do they send it straight to the vendor? Do they come to someone like us to help us help them coordinate with the vendor to get the vendor the information, et cetera, et cetera? So the other side, apart from just the vendors and, and their fixing, is the, the finding and the how does it get handled before other people know about it uh, side right. of things. Yeah, so the, the different people or roles involved in this vulnerability management sounds really important, like the vendor, yep. the people who run the software that they buy from the vendor, the researchers, the coordinators, right? But so how is CVSS involved in that? Or what is CVSS in the first place? Uh, Broad level, I guess CVSS is the, the, I guess, industry standard at the moment anyway, uh, for uh, ranking the severity of of vulnerabilities, I suppose. Um, It's a single number that 
is spit out of an equation, and uh, it's it's meant to tell people how severe something is supposed to be. Okay. So I think that's kind of my high-level take on it. Yeah, and, and there's – well, I, sort of shifting into what, one of the issues that we saw that, that started some of this work is it's a number, uh, and there, there are uh, – eight or ten different variables that go into producing that number. It goes through some complicated math and comes out the other end as a number. Uh, but then it's the same number for everybody. And, uh, you know, vendors might might have different decisions than than the uh, network owners or, or any of the system owners or, um, or the coordinators or the researchers too. Yeah. So, like, everybody has – everybody sort of has their own priorities, but they're all using the same number. And if you just – sort all of if you sort everything by cvss score and sack them then you might wind up choosing something that shouldn't be your, your highest priority according right? to your according to your, according to your, your perspective on it right. right yeah yeah and so i know that we we talked about this in a prior podcast people can go look 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 at and listen to for uh background on on what sort of is a problem with that um but is the equation that you talked about like is it clear how that was developed there, there's certainly a description of the process which involved uh, the first uh, CVSS special interest group in the first community uh, form of incident, res incident response and security. Incident response teams? and security teams, yeah. Teams, yeah. The form of incident response and security teams. Um, so they took a set of vulnerabilities. Uh, they just, I believe they decided that it was uh, – these were the vulnerabilities that were that they wanted to evaluate using uh, input vectors, and they sort of uh, decided what ordering those, what priority those things should have, what severity those things should have, rather, um, and then fit a model to that. And that the way that that model was fit is not entirely transparent, uh, even in the documentation they have on on what the right. what the formula. Yeah, yeah. I mean, taking the, taking the the. the the inputs, the 10 or so inputs right. that you mentioned as things, kind of uh, identifiable things and transferring them into numbers, um, somehow stuff gets lost in, in the in the shuffle, I suppose. Right. Yeah, so Alan, you made a little bit of a sort of quibble there between severity and priority. I think maybe that actually, the difference between those two words maybe is the lead into what we've decided to do. Mm -hmm. So can you introduce the stakeholder specific vulnerability categorization and like what we are proposing to do to support vulnerability management sort of maybe in addition to CVSS or instead of depending on in terms of uh, splitting between kind of prioritizing and severity? Yeah, so like what's the difference like the between in vulnerability management, what's the difference between your priority about how you're going to act on a vulnerability and the severity of the vulnerability right. and how does that inform sort yeah, of the high level bit of our work? So priority, I think, has a lot to do with actions, which I think, as we mentioned in here, is kind of what we take as our you know, like kind of takeoff point, which is, you know, you have a priority of things. That's that's the, the stuff you're going to actually do. Severity is is somehow a measure of the, the thing that you're talking about. So I think there's a there's a big split right there. And we're choosing to focus in this work on. The prioritization side of things, rather than the severity. Severity has a part, but it's not. Uh, it's not the focus. It's not the entirety of it, as as it kind of is with CVSS. So I think, too, severity has uh, a certain connotation, especially if you go back a decade or two when CVSS or the or the notions that that evolved into CVSS were really being discussed. About the worst thing you could do at the time was take over a machine. Uh, so most of that is geared towards how likely is it or how, how, how close is an attacker to being able to completely take over a machine, uh, which is a great model for circa 1999. Well, in yeah. machine, you mean laptop or desktop computing device, not right. an auto plant assembly machine or airplane. Or, or an airplane, or, yes. <laughs> or, or an election system. You know. um, <clears throat> There, there, yeah, so there, there are lots of sort of macro scale impacts that can happen uh, that don't necessarily involve uh, taking over a machine. In fact, uh, you know, data breaches weren't really much of a thing when that when all that occurred. Um, and one of the things we found with uh, Internet of Things, especially, especially when you get into like medical devices and, and more safety critical systems, uh, including you know industrial control systems and things, is that availability is actually probably more important than uh, than confidentiality. Uh, really, you know, you you want the machine to continue working even if it's leaking data all over the place because the machine's doing some critical function that keeps somebody alive or keeps somebody safe. Um, so those sorts of impacts are not 
terribly well considered. Uh, or not, they're not they're not as clear cut in in CVSS. So, how does our work address sort of the transparency issues that we just talked about with CVSS? CVSS yeah, I mean, so we've you know to to kind of start going into it, we're we're, we're choosing to use decision trees as the as the method by which we'll prioritize things, and uh, the. The transparency is, is pretty clear because for each of the decisions we're making on these trees, uh, it's it's very clear what we're meaning by which choice we're making along the tree. So I think that's the first step to the transparency answer is um, here, here, here are our branches, here are our options to choose from when moving our way down a tree. And uh, at each point, we have some pretty clear rules uh, for describing exactly why you would choose branch one, branch two, et cetera. And those trees were developed by, by humans Sitting around talking about what this, what the decisions were, and sort of what the, what the granularity of the decision actually is. Uh, so they're not, they're not decision trees that are just fit on a big data set, and you run some decision tree, you know, algorithm over it and get a decision tree out of it. It's, it's actually based on, uh, uh, you know, experts sitting around the table and, and understanding the problem. Right. So, uh, can you maybe walk us through a simple example? I think that probably trying to quote a vulnerability off the top of our heads might be a little bit difficult, <laughs> but there have been some uh, some important ones over the last you know, bit of time. Uh, one that comes to mind maybe is the uh, like crypt API DLL, the Windows like failure to authenticate uh, crypt, uh, crypto certificates properly, mm. right? So um, if I am trying to decide whether to update my Windows machine, maybe Windows Server that's running, say, the Kerberos Active Directory stuff. Like, I'm the patch applier. Mm -hmm. What decisions, what questions do I have to answer in SSVC in order to make a decision about how much effort I need to put into patching that system? So... Our model. We should also also say that we do we, ha we actually do have different uh, different decision trees for both patch appliers and patch deployers. Right, um, which gives us the stakeholder specific. Which gives us stakeholder specific. That's, the, that's, that's, the, that's the what makes it that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. So Microsoft has already issued the patch. Right. It's right. Out there. They are already the patch deployer. They yep. have decided to do it. Yeah. So they, it's Tuesday on their own. They would have done their own yep. thing on their tree if they were if if we weren't at this point in the example. Yeah. Um, and now we're at the, a different point, which we're pretending to be applier. Should we apply this patch? Yeah. Or, Ahead of others, or not? Yeah, things like this. Yeah. So the first, the first question that our tree asks is about exploitation, and that really comes down to, you know, are there is are there reports of uh, adversaries actively exploiting this? Um, are there known exploits available, even if they're not being actively used? Uh, you know, things like does does it show up in Metasploit? Does it show up in Exploit DB or yeah. anywhere publicly? Um, or the other option is none. Uh, yeah. So you can. Uh, you know, you don't have any knowledge of it. So, depending on those, on w which of those three options you're on, you then move on to uh, it's exposure in exposure. each case. Yeah, okay. yeah, after that. So, and I think that there is a proof of concept for how to structure a certificate that will be verified incorrectly for that crypt API DLL. So, there's a proof of concept at least, and let's go with that for now. Right. This may change, of course, by the time you're listening to this, everyone. <laughs> But that's part of the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that this is fluid, right? We can yeah. we can adjust as needed. Get on a different tree if you have to. Well, actually, exploitation should be the only one of these four questions that changes over time. I suppose that's right. Yep. But anyway, let's yeah. say that it's proof of concept for now. Then where do we go? Uh, exposures next, at least as we have it listed. And the the good thing about the trees, as we talked about when we made them, was uh, there isn't really an order to these things, right? They could be placed in any order whatsoever. In the paper themselves, we've got exposure next, but it could have gone to mission impact or safety impact next. Um, but this is the path that was that was chosen for the trees as we outlined them in the in the, in the paper itself. And so uh, the next thing you'll evaluate is, is exposure. Um, I guess I'd say the exposure is uh, how, well. So my Active Directory server, is it connected directly to the internet without a firewall in between it and the internet? Or not, yeah, right. So. <laughs> The, the level at which it's accessible, I guess yeah. it would be a way to describe exposed. exposed. Yeah, ex exposed, <laughs> right, to describe the exposure. And you've got small un, uh, small controlled or unavoidable as your choices uh, in, in any particular case. And yeah. then you'll move to the to the next. So in this case, if it's, not, if it, if it's an active, active Directory server, that's probably controlled. Um, it's not like a web server or a DNS server, which would be uncontrollable. Uh, Where its, it's job a, is it, connect it, to the it's internet. Its job is to be talking to the internet all the time. Um, active Directory is... 
it has to be exposed to your internal network, but it also doesn't have to be exposed to the internet, so that's yeah. more controlled. Um, and also, uh, we have small, which I think is more about the uh, either air-gapped or uh, even just tight, very tightly controlled yeah. uh, enclaves within right. your network. But your Active Directory server is probably only one hop away from the internet, and that hop is some individual, well, a, cl a cluster of humans clicking on emails mm -hmm. connected to the internet all have to be able to talk to the AD server, so that can't really be said to be uh, small. small. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think I would I would go with control, control. For, for this example. Yeah, so I didn't tell you guys that we were going to score yeah, one of these right. on the fly. See how easy it is? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so, so you know, if you're moving your way down, right, we've got we've got uh, a proof of concept in place as far as exploitation goes. We've got controlled as far as the the measure on exposure. Uh, the next the next thing on the list out of the four things is mission impact, and this is where it'll really be specific to the company that or vendor that you are, uh, organization, right? organization that you are. That's right. Yeah. So, um, you know. Abstractly, it's actually hard to answer this because we don't know who we are yeah. in this case. Uh, so we there are a selection of options here, um, describing how uh, severely or or minorly, I guess, uh, your particular organization is right. going to be impacted by this. Right. So we need to know what the organization's mission is before we can to... say what the impact on the mission is. Yes. Of course. Right. Um, but the AD server is what lets everyone log into all their computers. So if your organization needs people to work on, on computers, computers, right. It's going to probably be at least impactful in some supporting mm -hmm. your mission, mission essential functions to have the AD server running. Yep. But also, unless it's your organization's job to just run computers for people to log into, it's probably not actually the thing your that, mission yeah, right. to run them. To run the computers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, I guess just to run on the options so that we can make yeah. some clarity in, ter in terms of how you're you know, delineating what's going on here. Our choices for, for mission impact are none uh, degraded, uh, mission essential functions crippled, mission essential functions failing, or mission just mission fail altogether. Uh, and and those are those are the the strata by which we'll yeah. try to choose uh, how this would affect any particular organization. Mm -hmm. Or if you're an organization doing this, your organization, yeah. of course. And so, Alan, I know that I sort of stole mission essential functions from FEMA, but can you talk a little <laughs> bit for the people who aren't in the federal civilian government space, like? A little bit about what that sort of means and how we translate it to sort of regular private sector industries. Yeah, so uh, it, it works its way up from low impact to high impact. So mission mission failure at the high, at the high end is uh, you know the organization ceases to exist or is unable to achieve its mission. Uh, for example, if a hospital had to shut down uh, even temporarily because of uh, the impact of a vulnerability, then you know, that would be a mission failure, uh, at least, you know, for some, some area of time. Um, mission essential function failure would be uh, some function that is uh, provided to the organization by the system, but not, not necessarily enough to make it completely collapse, but you definitely are in a situation where uh, if it doesn't get fixed soon, you're going to be at yep. risk of, of more yep. cascading failures. Um, uh, mission essential function support crippled, uh, is somewhat less than and I don't I don't quite recall what the distinction was. It's that the uh, that one in it's that the field. supporting functions are <clears throat> are stopped, but that it doesn't actually stop the mission essential function from happening right now. But that situation probably can't continue. You're like on uh, you're on backup power basically. Yeah. So and the like, generator is going to run out of fuel eventually. Point, yeah. <laughs> so lo poss possibly loss of redundancy. Yeah. Uh, act, yeah. You're you're operating in a, in a sort of degraded situation. Uh, Non-essential degraded is is really one where uh, some function that's not necessarily mission critical is is down or or degraded or temporarily yeah. disabled or whatever, um, but it's not. You can you can limp along with that condition yeah. for indefinitely and and not have not have to worry about it for too long, um, and then obviously none is. Yeah. And so if we're an organization that hasn't figured out what our mission is. Um, FEMA, and we cite this, has guidance on how you elicit mission essential functions from your mission and all of this stuff, which people can follow through on. Um, but they shouldn't have to do this for every vulnerability, right? Like, once we do this once, we should know what the mission impact of our AD server is, right, for every vulnerability that might be in it. Is that right? Yeah, I, I believe it's, e it's either at the at the individual server level or even at the service level uh, across your enterprise. You, you, make this you make this decision once for that service or server. And at that point, you you know the answer until that changes. So, but that that'll change far less frequently than you'll be dealing with vulnerabilities. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So from what you said, I think that this takes us through the middle path again <clears throat> through Cripple. The crippled. Let's say. Right. Sure. Yeah, sure. We, can, we can go that route. Uh, and then and then finally, before we actually reach our our answer, we'll assess the the safety impact of the of the vulnerability. And our our choices um, are, are numerous here, and in fact, lots of these on our tree for space reasons are collapsed into like all others. Uh, and at the higher end, you have catastrophic and then hazardous, and they tick down from there. Um, Tommy, we've got. I'll flip back five five of them. So catastrophic, hazardous, major, uh, minor, and then none. And yeah. so each of those in the in the paper itself is laid out with the, yep. the, the, the pieces that uh, describe that one accurately. Yep. And so, Ray, we adapted these from both the Federal Aviation Administration, if I can remember how FFA yes. expands, okay. but also with uh, some insights into well-being as defined by the Centers for Disease Control. And so we've like used as much as we can other people's assessments of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but as bad as the thing that lets everyone log into their email is getting compromised, it's not the sort of thing that causes airplanes to fall out of the sky, right? And so although this is probably bad for the organization, the mission, it might not be so bad for uh, like human well-being, right? For the safety, right. yeah. The safety. So is that the difference there? That and also we should note that we took a fairly broad definition of safety in, in mm -hmm. this report. Um, so we might be using it differently than folks in, you know, like the industrial control systems world would use it where it Safety is really well defined uh, in in that environment. Um, in in our case, we I, we include that definition of safety in ours, and I think I think these uh, categories also track with with those categories that you you run across there. Um, but this also includes you know ideas like uh, financial safety or even psychological risk or you know bodily harm or you know lot, lots of sorts of things. Up to and including, uh, you know, at the higher ends, it's more like societal impact. Um, yeah, rather than in, in impacts <clears throat> on individuals, it's impacts on like systems of individuals, and groups. Yeah, uh, or or, harm. or or even you know, uh, entire services provided to you know a population of, of mm -hmm. people or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think. That, yeah, that covers that. that. Yeah. The point. So that's how. Uh, that's how someone who's deciding to apply a patch would right. do that. Yes. Um, that's where we've got the document now. And I think that one of the things we're looking for is feedback on those details so that they're right. But like, how hard would this be to try to automate? Well, I, I think first let's, let's finish. I, oh yeah. We should finish, Please. just follow up and finish what we had. So sure. we had, we, you know, following through each of the nodes, what we would go uh, down to our, our exploitation, <laughs> exposure, mission impact, and then safety impact. Um, the, the safety impact, as you noted, falls into the, the lower category here. So that's going to fall into these all others on the particular uh, chart we've got here at hand. And that means that it's going to end up being a scheduled um, a scheduled patch for the, the organization, the, the mythical one that we have in question here. Mm -hmm. um, the other options, in case there were different vulnerabilities or different organizations, they, they run from def defer, which is just do nothing. Uh, scheduled, which is do it when you would normally do these things. Don't, you know, don't, don't break stride to do this. Um, out of band, which means, yeah, break some stride and kind of do it as soon as you can, and then immediate, which is drop everything and get this done. Um, and so those that's, you know, in using a, a tree, that would follow through with the, the example I yeah. had and tell you exactly what you're going to end up with. And so all of our final results there are one of those four, which yeah. hopefully helps either the, the the patch developer, or which we weren't going through, or the, or the applier, which we were, um, tell them when or how soon they need to actually address the, yeah. the issue at hand. So what are the, and thanks for going over the suggested meanings yeah, of those. Right, yeah. Of course, we're not like trying to bind anyone to nope. those meanings, but those are our suggestions. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's, a, I think, a good example of how it works for, works for the applier. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we need to uh, bore everyone with another one for the <laughs> patch developer, but I think that everyone sort of sees how this goes. Um, what else do we sort of... Uh, ask people to bring to the table, maybe that's slightly different from CVSS, like, is this more or less effort, or like, what's the benefit to the slightly increased effort to the patch applier, and what is the sort of like down the road benefit if we do get this sort of a little bit more refined and automated, like, what are the potentials for sort of automating some of this, and like, integrating it with asset management and these sorts of things? Well, to the first part, I mean, as far as like, Difficulty or not? I mean, I, I guess it probably would be a little more difficult than CVSS because with CVSS you essentially plug in the stuff on on, on the web page and it'll give you your number, right? It's, it's a bit of a just plug in and go. Here you need to think about your specific organization, but that's where you get the, the benefit of the little bit of extra effort, I think, because yeah. it's very much tailored to you. Uh, at least that's that's kind of my my view on it. 
Yeah, and, and most of the hard work comes in the mission impact and the safety impact, which really, again, and those are system level things. They're not necessarily, they're not per vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So That's true. the things that change over time uh, with each vulnerability is really the uh, exploitation. exploitation. And, mm -hmm. and I guess exposure somewhat, but sure. even exposure is more particular to uh, the service. So you may have, you, you can, might be able to go through in one assessment and figure out what your exposure, your mission impact, and your safety impacts are for all of your systems. Um, and once you have that, you have it. So mm -hmm. now that just becomes a lookup table. Yeah. Um, and then what you need to know is, well, is this thing being exploited today or not? Um, or are there POCs available? Um, and that you can get fairly readily from, you know, as, as simple as just pay attention to Metasploit and Exploit DB and use that as a, as a gauge or uh, pay attention to Twitter um, and maybe subscribe or, or pay for a, a threat intelligence feed or something like that. But, uh, you know, that, that probably becomes available to you as a data feed one way or another as well. And now you can just sort of, you know, take, take your inventory and your threat intelligence feed. Uh, and if those are in the, in a decent format where you can extract this data easily from them, now you can just combine them up and get those four, get the values for those four right. variables and look it up in a table and have your answer. Mm -hmm. Great. The, the question that I've been getting a lot as I've talked about this a few different places in January is like, is this ready to be used, right? And as a federally funded research development center, an important role that we serve is an honest broker of information, right? Uh, a way to do things that is not biased by a profit motive or, or something else. Um, so what do we need to do to get this ready for anyone to use? I mean, more feedback is probably the, the main thing, right? As, as we're pretty clear about here, this is the proposal, right? We're, we're proposing this and we've run through a lot of hours of discussing mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, you know, internal kind of testing the ideas and, and running through it. But it's, that's not going to be a substitute for kind of a wide scale, like, hey, everybody look at this thing and let us know what you think. So yeah. I think first first and foremost is more exposure and more yeah. feedback about, about what we've got here. And our, our evaluation has largely been, you know, through role playing, uh, you know, we've as we, we did here in the example we, earlier. Right. We've each brought some experience in the outside world to the table uh, with different organizations and how they do vulnerability management. Uh, and we've walked through scenario, you know, done scenario based uh, role play to to evaluate a, a number of vulnerabilities. But that's not that's not the same as uh, people who actually have their fingers on keyboards and can deploy patches in real networks and have to pay the price when that patch goes badly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we you know we really do need that feedback from operational folks to, yeah. to give us that sort of information you know, and actual the actual context of actual vendors and what they would do because we're yeah. saying imagine we're this or the such right they, yeah. they'll know exactly what they've got yeah. what they're running how they need to deal with it etc so yeah. so is what we've published uh with ssvc ready for interested organizations to beta test and give us feedback on if if they have the data that they need to input to this, or they can easily get it, then yes, I think you know if, if you've got if you've got a, ne a network inventory or a system inventory that you can apply to this, and you have threat intelligence feeds, uh, you can potentially manually do this. Um, if you want to try some automation, we've put uh, a, a little bit of Python scripting out on GitHub, right. uh, which will have a link available for you. Um, that does the lookup for you given the assuming that you've got the data to input to it so okay. it doesn't do anything to help you figure out what your answers to those four questions are but it does if you have those answers it can give you the lookup table and, and give you an answer um so that's that's available uh for folks who can you know are ready to be able to integrate that um even if it was just a tabletop exercise that someone decided to do at an organization to see you know does this look like it would work for us uh we we could still use that feedback too, just because, like I said, the more the more experienced folks we have who look at this and try to use it or at least evaluate it, the more, the better off we're going to be able be able to improve it over time. Great. I think we'll put a contact link in the show notes for anyone. Right. Yeah, sounds really good. Um, so, given all of that and the work that we've put into this over the last year, year and a half, mm -hmm. with talking about what CVSS <laughs> needs to have changed. And then what SSVC can bring to that change and sort of move the process along. Uh, what are the future areas, like next future areas of work uh, on sort of prioritizing vulnerability management? Um, well, I, one that I'm actually interested in, given what I'm doing with the, the coordination stuff uh, right now, is, is developing a tree for coordinators. Um, it was on it was on our table initially. We, we had it in here, but it, it kind of... It, 
blossomed on us all of this and we decided let's put that one on the back burner for next time and i'm really interested in, in getting to that so um first and foremost at least on from my perspective is working on the the tree um that coordinators might use to yeah. to, to work with this sort of stuff i think too I and mean, we've talked to we've talked here about the uh system owner uh, version of the tree. Uh, we haven't really talked as much about the, the patch developer versions of the tree, which do have some different variables in them, mm -hmm. um, which we also need feedback on as well. And one of those is uh, technical impact, and the other one is sort of is attacker utility. So, what do, what does the attacker gain by uh, by exploiting this? And we we sort of break that down into uh, really two dimensions of does it make the attacker does it make attacks very efficient, or do they gain a lot of value by exploiting a few machines or a few systems, or is that more diffuse? Uh, in that they might, you know, so so the concentrated value is uh, I can break into the database and steal the entire database. Uh, diffuse value might be if I hit a thousand machines, I can build a botnet out of a thousand machines, and now I have compute or network capability. Yeah. You know, so that that's sort of the, what the attacker utility means. Um, understanding how that works on the developer side as well. Uh, is going to be important to us as, too. So I think there's a there's definitely opportunity there, not just for feedback from uh, system owners, but also from the, the folks who develop software and have to prioritize their incoming queues. Yeah. Um, CVSS itself actually might fit into the technical impact right. uh, portion of, of of this whole thing, but uh, so under uh, sort of understanding how does this fit in a context where CVSS continues to exist and people are already using it, but Maybe you also want to, you know, add this decision tree mechanism on top of that, yeah. um, and sort of understanding that is another another angle that I think we can go forward with this. Great. Well, uh, do you have anything else that inquiring minds need to know about <laughs> vulnerability management? <laughs> so, I, one one point we should make is if you are in the the very uh, fortunate position to have enough capacity that you can patch everything, that's what you should do. Uh, there's there's no reason you, you don't need prioritization scheme you don't need severity scores if you can if you can service all of the vulnerabilities that come in your front door and fix them do that it's only when you don't and unfortunately I think almost everybody is in that second category uh, only when you don't that you actually need to be able to prioritize things so right. um, really just to don't don't forget the fundamentals if you have the capacity to do it just fix stuff yeah yeah I think that's uh, yeah. I don't have I don't have anything specific to add. I don't think at this point. Um, I think that that's that's yeah. right. I mean, it, it, this is this is a prioritization scheme, right? So if you only have if you can do them all, you don't need to prioritize anything. You can just do them all. So. And but it is important that the recommendation is probably that if someone decided that it was important enough to fix the software, it's probably important enough for you to apply that fix. Yes. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, don't defer just because there are patches out there. I think Alan's describing a situation where you have the capability, the the, the resources, the time, the, all that stuff to actually apply all the yeah. patches and so do that. Well, sure. so one of the things that I've heard a couple of people say is that a transparent decision-making process about which things are important, if you get management to buy in, they're like, yes, this is our risk appetite and these, this is the like service level of quickness that I would like to be able to patch something that is this bad, right? If your uh, vulnerability management team or your SOC or whatever it is can't keep up with the pacing that comes out of a very transparent decision-based process on risk, you have very good evidence to go to management and say, we need to hire more people because mm -hmm. you, you have said that this is your risk appetite. You have said that this decision process matches your risk assessment and we're not keeping up with it. Mm -hmm. So we need more resources. Mm -hmm. So there's both sides of this being potentially useful, right? It's if you don't have enough resources, you need a way to tell people. And I, and I think that that goes back to the, you know, how is this more transparent? And part, one of the transparency pieces there is that it, it is, it's not only explainable, but it's also understandable by, uh, you know, senior executives who, who have a sense of, you know, well, if this happens to my business, that's bad. I understand how bad that is. And I therefore want to do that. If, and this, um, this affects my safety profile and I understand how bad that is. So it helps you to translate some of that uh, into something that, you know, both the folks on the front lines handling vulnerability management stuff and the folks in the boardroom can understand, you know, this is why we're making these decisions about these vulnerabilities. 
And if you're wrong, you can have a meaningful conversation about, well, okay, which of these which of these pieces is are we, are we not connecting on? Yeah. Versus uh, just what, what what does that number mean? Uh, like I so I don't know what that. Yeah. Means, versus so why why didn't you patch all the seven point threes? Yeah. Right. Which doesn't necessarily have much meaning. No. To someone who's not familiar with CVSS. No. Right. Well, and and the uh, of course, like in the way that CVSS is done, like it's not always obvious that what they're doing is sort of a, uh, you know. Uh, fastest plus fastest equals two. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Yeah, so of course it's not un- understandable because yeah. that's sort of what they're doing. Right. Yep. Right. Turning so, turning descriptors and actual things into numbers almost arbitrarily yeah. um, leaves you with an arbitrary number that you might think means something different than I think it means. Yeah. Right. So yeah, great. Well, thank you for being here and talking about this work. Yeah. Thanks. All right. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We will include links in the transcript to all of the stuff that we've talked about, all the various resources. Um, and we'll also include, of course, a link to the white paper with SSVC defined in all of the gory details. Um, there's also a blog post that Alan uh, led out and you'll be able to find a link to that is a sort of short summary to what we've talked about today. Um, this podcast is available at the SEI website. Um, and if you are listening to this, you already know that. Because <laughs> that's where you got it. <laughs> As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us. Uh, info at sei.cmu.edu will get to us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.